the golden hour here. It's a perfect setting uh, to tell my professional life story, I guess, uh, is what it is, which also encompasses, to some degree, my personal life story, which I'll get into a little bit. But um, my personal story is kind of inherent in the storytelling that I've done as a, as a professional. A lot of people say that you always tell some version of your own story in your work, whether it's art or design or fiction or nonfiction. To some degree, you're expressing some sense of, 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 of self on some level. Um, my journey began, in, I'm going to date myself, but 1968. And I was born, I like to say I was born into the story of race in America. My birth mother was uh, white, and my birth, actually, you know what, since we're multimedia, I actually have a picture I can share with you. My, my birth mother was white, she was a hippie, 1968, a lot of drugs. <laughs> While I was floating around in there, she was playing a lot. Um, my birth father was black, they, they hooked up, it was nothing, nothing big. You guys are getting, getting a glimpse into my crazy uh, organizational situation here on my Google Drive. And, um, you know, he offered to marry her, but she was like, if you, if you, if you do that, if you get married, my father will bury you in our backyard. And then I would get into that. And this was 1968. Um, so he was like, well, maybe my sister could take you. And this was, this was Akron. I was born in Akron, Ohio. Uh, like Steph, we'll get to Steph Curry eventually, but uh, and LeBron, by the way, was born in Akron, so maybe I could have been a professional basketball player. But, you know, <laughs> but uh, she, he was, he was like, John, on second thought, I maybe mean, my sister's not the right person to kind of, kind of raise, raise, you know, our child. Uh, so they made the difficult decision to put me up for adoption, and. Uh, So if you see this, this picture, this is my family. It's my birth mother's family. Very conservative family. This is my, uh, I guess my grand, my grandfather here, grandfather. Um, not saying they were the, the Ku Klux Klan or anything like that, but um, you know, they were very conservative, white family in Ohio. And this is this is my birth mother right here, Susan Harris, and you can see maybe that little moment there. That's me. <laughs> I was floating around there, I had no idea what was happening. Um, and for, uh, let's see, that was in 1968, and I didn't find my birth mother until I was making the second film in my trilogy, The Force, in, in, in 2014. But I'm going to get to that in the story later. But she put me up for adoption, it was a really difficult decision. I was raised by, I was adopted by and raised by a black family uh, who was living in, in Ohio at the time. I lived in Shaker, anybody from Ohio knows Shaker Heights. So I lived in Shaker for about a year, year and a half. And then um, my mom, who, who, my adopted mom, is from um, Boston via Cape Verde. So her parents came over for, uh, from Cape Verde Islands uh, when they were in their early 20s. And, and, um, my father was from South, South Carolina, but they sort of migrated to, to sort of Philadelphia. So we were an East, East Coast family. So I was raised in a black church, you know, big family. Mom's one of ten, dad's one of eight, cousins for miles. A lot of them went to HBCUs. I basically went to white private schools, um, but was raised in the black church and had this family. And so I, I had this mixed race kid raised in a black family, all kinds of identity issues on top of being, you know, adopted, and so I decided I was going to go to Howard to get in touch with what it was it mean to be a black man in America. So, um, so I went to Howard, and first thing I did was buy a six-pack of beer, and uh, I had no idea what Howard was. I, I, I understood, like, oh, it's an HBCU. May, may not even have understood that, uh, that term at the, at the point. People would say, where do you go to, where are you going to college? I'd say Howard, they'd say Harvard. I said, no, Howard, Howard. And uh, no idea. 
No, no idea that, that, that they had a cinema program, some, some of the greats in cinema went, went there, the great Top Highly Grandma, and eventually Bradford Young went, went to that, their cinema program. Um, Spike Lee's director of photography went to the cinema program. Um, I, I was just like, the drinking age was 18. I was like, hell yeah, let's go. And that's what I did for the next couple of years. Um, eventually dropped out. Um, went to work at the Fifth Gun. Anybody from DC? from back in the day, or, or know the, the club scene from the 80s, like the tunnel in New York, okay, I'm here, I can see a couple of nods. <laughs> and this was the late 80s, okay, there's a lot of club kids, drugs, is the height of the war on drugs in, in D.C. We're talking Mayor Marion Barry got busted smoking crack with a prostitute that we call Mayor Polite Barry. Um, Rafael Edmonds was running a giant drug ring in D.C. with the Nation of Islam guarding apartment buildings. And so I was in all that, you know, I dropped out of school, I was working at the Com, which was across the street from the 930 Club, which was a sort of punk, punk uh, club in D.C. And just kind of like, you know, spiraled and, you know, got, got addicted to, to cocaine. Uh, cocaine actually calm, calms me down. It's kind of like where they get kids in Berlin. I loved cocaine when I first saw it, and I was like, well, this is what I need, you know, to sort of like focus. <laughs> and it, it, but I didn't understand that, you know, it was also going to like drain my bank account, prevent me from paying rent. And so at that point, um, I was hanging out with these like four guys, uh, Jock, who went to St. Albans, which is a prep school in D.C. There's like civil well, friends, St. Albans, this is where like, Obama sent his kids, okay? This is like where heads of state, titans of industry, and presidents send their children. So, Jock went there. I met him through a friend, and uh, he had like a couple of Toyota Supras, a Siberian Husky, a condo. I mean, we're like, we're like 19, 20 years old. And I'm like, what is, how, how does he, what does this guy do? He's like, oh, he sells Amway. <laughs> Like, yeah, man. I, okay, all right. Eventually, I, I realized that actually he was selling cocaine. At this point, um, I was not paying my rent. I was dro I dropped out of Howard. My parents, I, I was somehow covering up the fact that I wasn't paying the rent. Being an entrepreneur, as, I, as, as you will discover as I start talking about more of my career, my entrepreneurial uh, Spirit was, was ignited at this point, and I proposed, I found out that Jacques was actually not selling Amway. So I proposed that I would be a conduit to a lot of potential clients of the Fifth Column via his scheme, which I realized that he had uh, for about, it's really crazy, because we were, we were 20 at the time, so he'd been doing this since he was like, I guess 16 or something like that. He somehow got, a, a contact in Bogota, South America, bought, bought this connection, paid for it, and then he would send the, this connection um, money, and in, in return they would send cocaine flattened in greeting cards throughout the whole office boxes all over DC. And he had these like um, Jamaican guys who would pick up the, the, the letters from him and deliver them to him, and then he would, he would sell the drugs. He'd been doing this for about five years. And so I was like, um, yeah, like let's start like a let's start a subsidiary, subsidiary of this operation <laughs> at the fifth column, and I'll, I will I will generate more revenue for this, this operation. And and he was like, okay, great idea, let's do it. Literally uh, three months later, uh, and the, the drugs would come regularly in the in the U.S. mail, and um, they had stopped coming the drugs, which I did not like because I wasn't really in this thing to make money, I was in this thing to stay like high, that was my, my main sort of goal. And when the drugs stopped, it was not, it was like, where are the drugs? And he was like, I'm not sure, sometimes like the, 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 the flow gets off or the schedule gets off, you just have to be patient and wait. And, and then one day out of nowhere, he's like, oh, we're, we're on again, we, we got a new shipment. But can you go pick, pick them up? And I had never actually been to the post office. The Jamaicans are supposed to do that. I had never done it myself. 
And so he was like, no, 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 you, you, you need to go. Here's the keys. I got to go. My car got stolen from King's Dominion, which is a, a theme park in, in, in D.C. My car got stolen. I got to go get the car, deal with the insurance people. Just why don't you go get this batch of letters, you know? And I was like, great, because I'm thinking I will now have cocaine and I, everything will be good. So I go. I uh, got the keys, went to the post office box, which I believe was near this, the border of Silver Spring, Maryland. And I'll never forget that day. Walked in, it was literally empty. It was hot, you know, it was like August in, in D.C. If you, if you know D.C., it's incredibly muggy and hot. Went in there, it was like ice cold, the air conditioner was going, there was like a clock on the wall, and I could literally hear it ticking, tick, 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 tick. It was a movie. And, uh, Except I didn't realize like I was actually in the movie and something bad was about to happen. <laughs> and, I, and I remember opening the door of the post office. These are like old school post office boxes, like giant wall post office boxes. And I opened the door and I saw the letters and then there was like six or seven of them. And then at the back of the, the, the post office box, I saw a little slip of paper just kind of hanging there. And I, I remember thinking, that's strange. And why is that little piece of paper hanging there? <laughs> and it's fine. Grab the letters, put them in my backpack, walked out of the post office box, post office, and heard like guns being like chambered and you know down on the ground and in the sort of area outside the post office were probably 20 to 30 federal agents, it was like DEA, postal inspector, etc. And so that was the end of that, and I was arrested. Now, that began, um, you know, I would say that was 89, that was the summer of 89, this is the peak of the war on drugs. It began a pretty tumultuous, about a four year period where it could have gone either way for me. So there was prison, which it took about a year to get, for me to get sentenced and eventually report. And because it, it was a, there was no, there were no guns involved, um, I had no prior conviction, I was able to self-report to the prison. Um, that took about a year. Then I, I did a year, got out. Um, and, you know, generally you think, you know, that would be the wake-up call. You, you hear people talk about hitting bottom, you know, with sort of drug, drug addiction and whatnot. But for me, um, that actually had the reverse effect, because, yeah, you know, I think in my mind, it's like, my life's over now. I've got a record, how am I going to finish college, how am I going to get a job? And so I just sort of like checked out and I just actually uh, moved on from powder cocaine cocaine, and graduated to crack cocaine. So now, now I was like actually an official crack addict with the, with the criminal conviction on probation, tumbling in, in Washington, D.C. And this was like 91, 90, 92. Um, and I, I, you know, to this day, I can't exactly explain to you why I was able to stop that. And, and my first film, which I'd like to show you a clip of, gets into it a little bit, but I just stopped when that was December 6, 1993. They, there's something about like when you turn 25, your frontal lobe is fully developed. I, I was literally 25 years old at this, at this time. And, um, I just decided to stop. And about 10 months later, you know, going through rehab and NA meetings and AA and all that stuff, met, met uh, not in NA, but met a young woman uh, around that time who later became my wife. And that moment really started sort of getting me oriented to, toward, um, you know, building my life, life back. And at that time, that's when I decided to go back to, to Howard. And that was in 95. And I had to petition to get back in because my GPA was like 1.3. It was a miracle that it was even 1.3, to, to be honest. But I, I had to petition, get back in, and um, you know, was able to finish up my degree over those next uh, couple of years. I was a creative writing major because at that time I was like, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna write. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be a fiction writer. I'm gonna take my, my life experience and I'm gonna turn it into something that is meaningful to people. And, I was really focused on the creative writing, started writing about my family and about my own life experience. 
And then uh, I had to take a minor, and so I just picked journalism for some random reason. And then I had to do a project uh, for one of my journalism classes. And while I was in uh, AA, I met this guy named Joe, who was an intern at this little tiny news service called the Hispanic Link in DC. And it was run by this white guy named Charlie Erickson and his wife, who was from Oaxaca, Mexico. And it was like a love story. And because uh, the mainstream media wasn't really covering the Hispanic community in the news, like this little tiny hole in the wall became syndicated all around the country. And so I, I got this idea of making a little documentary. So I made this doc, and I went out and I rented a SVHS camera. SVHS, anybody remember that? Yes. Uh, this was right around the time when nonlinear editing was coming in, so I found this thing called Media 100, which is one of the first nonlinear editing systems. Ran these hot, like, tungsten lights and made this film and just fell in love with the whole thing, like the process of figuring it out, like the technical aspects of it, shooting it, um, the aspect of producing the thing, the story, and started thinking, huh, how do you do this like, as a career? And, and, and started researching and found that uh, a few places specialize in doc, documentary filmmaking. Northwestern was one of them, the Dill. Um, Berkeley was another, and, and NYU. And then I, I heard about this guy, John Nelson, who had just taken over. He had previously been at Stanford, but he moved over to uh, Berkeley to run the doc program. And he was a producer on Eyes on the Prize, which is a seminal civil rights series that was on PBS. And, um, and he also made this incredible film called The Day After Trinity, which is about Bob Robert Oppenheimer. So I was like, that's where I want to go. Applied, and by some miracle, because my GPA at this point had gotten up to about 2.6. Um, but I, you know, I, I pretty much got straight A's after I came back. And I didn't write in my essay about my story, but I just noted, I just said, you know, just so you know, I've been in crime, you know, an ex-convict, committed this crime, did, did this time in federal prison, but I didn't write about it, um, and they let me in. I, mean, I think they saw this like change, they saw sort of the before and the after, and they were really intrigued by that, so they, uh, they decided to, uh, to give me a shot. So that, that really kind of began my journey as a professional storyteller, and it started with you know studying under the great John Ellis, who's a, a, a remarkable um, talent. And um, after I graduated, my first job was working for PBS Frontline, which just won the Oscar for 20 Days in Mariupol. And big shout out to PBS. We, we need to keep supporting our public television and public broadcasting. Um, and um, they were doing a, a series on the war on drugs. Um, and so I was like, hey, I've got a lot of expertise in that. And I applied for it, got the job <laughs> as an associate producer. Um, did that, and then while I was working on that, John Ellis was trying to get this concept off the ground. He, he, he had been nominated for an Oscar for Day After Trinity, and then he um, made this film called Sing Faster, which is about um, La Boheme. It's about um, La Boheme from the perspective of the stagehands who put together the opera at the San Francisco Opera. And, and, and so, he had to write, despite being a remarkably accomplished filmmaker, Oscar-dominated filmmaker, he had to write about 140 funding applications to get that film funded and made. And so he was like, "This, we should not be doing this, we need to support artists. Um, and he was also a MacArthur Genius grantee, which is a basically an a unrestricted grant given to artists. And so he started this little documentary center around the premise of let's fund artists and not proposals. And we're going to give you an amount of money. You can do whatever you want with the money, but you can only spend that money. You can't raise any more money. That was the premise. And he asked, I was trying to, I was helping him kind of administer the program. And then he, one day he said, Pete, would you like to be our inaugural filmmaker? And I said, absolutely. Yeah. And so I got $100,000. This is in 2000, right at the turn of the millennium, to do anything I wanted. And I decided I wanted to explore the impact that my addiction and incarceration had on my family, which had never been talked about. And um, it's particularly sort of addiction and alcoholism in black families in America is something that's typically swept under the carpet. 
And so that's what I did. Um, so I'm going to start showing you some like little clips uh, from, from my work and going through um, the arc of my career. But this is technically my, my first, first film. First film. It's kind of horrific to be watching it because it, it, it's like you artists are the most self-critical people. But it, it's always interesting for me going back to sort of look at, uh, you know, the title of this talk is an accumulation of things. Like, I'm always amazed when I sort of step back and get perspective on sort of the arc of, you know, my life and thinking about it in the context of, of my, my work and sort of what I'm trying to communicate, you know, through my films. And to, to some degree, you know, my, my story is the American story and we're, we're living in an increasingly complex America, which a little, a little bit later I'll talk about some of the other work that delved directly into that. But fundamentally, uh, I'm always looking for that emotional angle, that, that, that thing that, and also the thing that, um, the universal themes that we're all sort of dealing with, whether it's family, community, uh, vulnerability, all these things are, are sort of inherent in, in all of our journeys so that my, my particular story can, can resonate with other people. Um, so, I, so I made this film and then I went off to, uh, to basically work in sort of like PBS ecosystem, the cable ecosystem. I was hired as a producer at ABC. I was kind of bouncing around. I did a couple at the Bay Area, so I did a couple of startups. One of them, I think my shares were, I could exercise them at like three cents. I basically wouldn't be here right now if that, if that company had gone public. I'd be, you know, living um, in Lahaina or, or you, know, you know, somewhere. Um, Lahaina is one of our uh, favorite, favorite places for our, our, our family, and, you know, when, when that burned down that was just like, you know, uh, tragic, but, you know, what, what struck us about Lahaina was this sense of community and the sense of history. And that's always been sort of the themes that I've tried to sort of weave, weave through my work. Um, so, you know, the start of thing, it was just something for me to, you know, pay my bills, make the living, kind of keep going, not sure where I was going. And um, my wife worked at, uh, works at Highland Hospital, and we, we both kind of came out of graduate school around the same time, and she's a refugee from, from Laos. And she has this deep connection with her patients, many of whom are uninsured. And at the time, from 2006, 2007, there was this really animated national conversation on healthcare. And I, I, I was thinking that it would be amazing to make a film about this community and how they were sort of using this hospital to, you know, as a basic as their primary care physician. Um, and the waiting room was born and we got access to the hospital. It didn't, it started um, not as a film and I, you know, I had to also, as an independent, raise awareness, raise money. And so what we kind of stumbled onto was that people were stuck in the waiting room for hours and hours and hours. And so we did this uh, storytelling project. We hadn't quite figured out what the film was gonna be yet. But we just started interviewing hundreds of people who were stuck in this waiting room and about some pretty private things and in this open air space and we didn't know if people would want to share their stories in this way and we quickly quickly realized that they had a deep need to, to do that and I think the reason why is because they they needed to their, their humanity reflected because I don't think they saw themselves in this sort of national conversation that was happening around sort of access to healthcare. So we just started interviewing like all these people and it was, it was quite remarkable. Um, it was kind of early, it was before Humans in New York, I don't know if you've heard of Humans in New York. It was kind of like that and then we, we were like, oh, let's put this in, in um, let's do a storytelling booth and put this in waiting rooms all over the country and it could be both a way to get a view into what people are experiencing, navigating life without health insurance, but it could also be a therapeutic tool for people in, in hospitals. And we 
partner, we were going to partner with IDO on it. It was going to be this like big thing. And what ended up happening is that the storytelling project sparked an interest over in ITBS, which is uh, one of the funders of a lot of public television documentaries that you see on PBS. And we actually got through the process of what's called Open Call, which is a funding um, application process for documentaries. And we were accepted. And so we had to quickly pivot away from the storytelling project to go, to go make the movie. Um, and so the storytelling project, is, it, it never kind of scaled out the way we hoped. But it did, it did enable us to go and, and, and make the movie. So that's the uh, way it was, it, it, I mean, it, it was just like a uh, very special project. And it, it was a tiny movie and it, it uh, we sent some sort of groundswell with it. So we, we, like, we like did a, a Kickstarter uh, campaign, we raised about 80 grand to put the movie in theaters, because in order to qualify for the Oscars, you have to be in, in, in theaters, and it, it was able to do um, uh, a run, and uh, I think we actually had somebody from the Grand Lake Theater tonight, where's, 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 and um, it, it just did gangbusters at the Grand Lake, and people came out in huge numbers, and it qualified for the Oscars, and eventually got shortlisted for an Academy Award, so it was really special special project, and um, obviously Rob and, and Mucho did, did the, the graphic work for the, for the project, which is really incredible. And I love so much like this, this idea of the clock and going on around the clock, one community, 24 hours, three hugs, four traumas, um, you know, no beds, the 11th hour, the waiting room. You know, it's just a really organic, beautiful design, and um, we were able to sort of utilize that throughout sort of the the, the campaign uh, of the film, and it also sort of set the foundation for what became a trilogy of, of, of movies. And so, um, you know, we were wrapped up in the release of the film for, you know, a year, year, and a year and a half, and then I started thinking about, I always knew that I wanted to look at the connections um, in a community and sort of looking at agency and a huge fan of The Wire, huge fan of Frederick Wiseman's work. Frederick Wiseman is a uh, documentarian from Boston who does like observational portraits of institutions. The guy's like 100 years old, he's still going, it's crazy. He did a film called At Berkeley um, here, here at Bay Area. Um, I always knew I wanted to look at the connections between access to health care, the criminal justice system, and education. And around this time, after The Waiting Room came out, you know, Everything was starting to bubble. Like I, I met actually um, my business partner Ryan Coogler on the waiting room because he, he was making a film called Fruitvale Station. Um, Oscar Grant um, was born and later died at Highland Hospital, and Ryan was trying to shoot scenes for his movie Fruitvale Station and, and couldn't get access. And somebody was like, "You need to talk to Pete Nixon." So we met and I, I got him into the hospital and we we we, we stayed in touch. Um, and obviously, he went off to, to make Creed. And, and uh, Black Panther and I, I kept going with my work, uh, you know, in Oakland, and was noticing what was going on with, uh, you know, the rise of Black Lives Matter and all that. And, you know, some have heard that the OPD at that time was a model for reform in the nation. Um, they were under federal oversight because of a huge civil rights uh, um, case in 2000, the Riders case where they were abusing the, the, the civil rights of people in Oakland, and so they were under federal watch, but they were making all kinds of progress reforming the department and, and had become a model for reform. So I basically approached them and said, um, you know, I'd like, I'd like to tell that story. I'd like to get access um, to your department to make a documentary. And because the waiting room had sort of done so well, they kind of roughly knew who I was and, and gave me access. And I told them, I said, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not you know, here to make a commercial about your success. I'm here to sort of tell the truth as I see it. And that's, that's the only catch here is that whatever happens, happens. And that's going to be what the movie is. And they, they agree to do it. And um, for some time, things were going well. And then they went out. <laughs> that, is, that is crazy, man. I have no idea how we made that movie. To be totally honest, like looking back on that, I it, it's quite.
crazy. And I, I, I don't, you know, I'm a director, but I have a whole team of people from like, my producers, uh, I shoot my own films, but I have people who, who shoot B camera, we have associate producers, interns, um, funders, uh, stakeholders, and then you of course have the um, subject, so to speak, which, which in this case was the Oklahoma Police Department, who to their credit allowed me to continue filming after things went south and sort of, sort of the shit hit the fan. And, and, and that, that's a testament, you know, to their uh, willingness to accept, you know, the reality of, of, of that narrative. And so, um, you know, we made that film. Um, did, you know, won the Sundance Director's Prize, um, did some great things. I think really sort of captured a zeitgeist moment and sort of conversation in America, and that's the power of what documentary can do, is it allows you, allows the audience into places that you would typically not be able to get access to. And I think that's integral, um, not just to our understanding of humanity, but to sort of our understanding of the function of democracy. So that's a big part of the overall ethos of, of, of sort of the notion of, of the trilogy. So, um, you know, Dust Self on, um, and again, Mucho did just phenomenal job that this, this sort of idea with the badge and, and the reflection and, and, and the badge of, of sort of you know what was going on in the streets at the time so sort of really in, in a sort of design sense captured not just the story but the moment in America that we were facing in, in such a such a powerful such a powerful way. Um, but yeah we knew that you know education was always going to be probably the anchor of, of the trilogy and um, and uh, found our way to open high school. Um, started developing the project in 20, you know, um, 18-ish, um, and then it really kind of kind of kicked in, into gear in, in 2019. And then we decided, you know, basically um, that we were going to tell the story of, of the class of 2020. Uh, little, little did we know. And is a characteristic of, of, of all my thing, all, all my films of crazy, unpredictable shit just happening that defines the movie. And with, with The Force, we were literally done with the movie when the set scandal broke out. I don't know if you guys remember the scandal um, at the OPD, but we were literally done with the movie, about to go to Sundance, uh, and had to re edit the whole thing at the sort of 11th hour. Um, and I think this, this movie might, might have sort of sort of talked it, but the notion of the film was to explore the emotional lives of young people uh, in America. And I grew up with films like um, Dating Myself and Anna and See What's Happened, Breakfast Club, yeah. <laughs> okay, Pretty Pay, Ferris yeah. Bueller, all that. Great movies, love them all, but they're all from the perspective of white suburban kids. Any kids of color who showed up in these movies are like, mom, don't, don't. You know, things and things. <laughs> so I was interested in the emotional lives of, of kids that look, 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 look like my kids, you know, kids of color, kids in a diverse, diverse city like Oakland, what's their emotional life like and what's, what are they going through? So that was the original impetus and we were embedded at the, uh, there's a counseling center at Oakland High School that provides services for the kids who might be dealing with anxiety or depression or suicidality but don't want to tell their parents or maybe they don't have access to a psychiatrist and so this, this clinic at the high school provided this service and we latched on to that, we got access to, to the, the clinic and we, we began filming there um, and then as you know happened in the force but in a much bigger way everything you know everything changed so I'm going to show you a clip from the um, Uh, so, so yeah, obviously, seismic events occurred, and you know, as a documentarian, you have to sort of, you know, be ready to sort of shift, to make adjustments, and, and, and follow that. And that's what we had to do with this this uh, this story. Coincidentally, one of the kids we had picked early on was sitting on the school board, and they were um, he was one of two student representatives of the entire school board. And one of the initiatives that they had, and we didn't see it until later when we were going through all the footage, but they had this little initiative going where they were trying to reallocate 
they were basically trying to close down the school police, which had like a three or four million dollar budget and reallocate all that money to mental health services for the kids. And that, and then COVID hit, and so we sort of shifted the narrative to these to these kids who were trying to, who had tried to get this uh, initiative passed. The school board had voted it down previously, and then in the wake of everything that happened, it wasn't just COVID, it was, you know, Ahmaud Arbery and uh, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, all of those things kind of happened, boom, 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 and then COVID, and then that, that led to um, the pairing their initiative plus this moment, and, and the thing was passed and settled like that, that became the movie. So it's really, I mean, extraordinary that we sort of that we sort of captured it. Um, it's serendipitous in a, in a lot of ways, and in, in a lot of ways, as documentary filmmakers, we our our, our job is to try to capture it and, and render it for, for an audience. But to, to some degree, it was just mostly a function of this remark, these remarkable things that kind of happened. Coincidentally, along this 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 time. Um, I, you know, Ryan had approached me to sort of start this company, um, Proximity, and um, Homeroom became kind of our first film. But Ryan, um, you know, wanted to make an impact. I mean, what he did, what, what he was able to do with Creed and, and, and Black Panther kind of showed the power of perspective and how we have, you know, been limiting ourselves. Um, you know, the Oscars So White movement has, has sort of been out there reminding us that, hey, we need to give opportunities to all kinds of different storytellers and not just, you know, white male storytellers or, you know, what if we gave a camera to a Native American? You know, have you seen Reservation Dogs, the show Reservation Dogs? Like, what if we reimagined Rocky from the perspective of this young kid from, from Oakland, you know? And I think Ryan, you know, showed the power of that, and I think Black Panther showed the power of this, this bigger idea in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, no less, of sort of colonization and Afrofuturism. And the, prior to that, the general um, narrative in Hollywood is you cannot sell movies with, with black actors overseas. And that was basically a rule for a long, long time. That affected how you cast your movie, it affected who was writing the movies, who was directing them, producing the movies, and so Ryan shattered all that. And that gave way to these opportunities. Um, and Disney, Bob Iger at Disney, chairman of Disney, at the approach Ryan. Um, and we have a, a TV deal with Disney. Um, we've carved out films, so our films can be anywhere, but you know, we're making television for um, for Disney. So we're in the we're in the fourth year of our journey. With this, with this uh, sort of company, and um, I run our, you know, Ryan asked me to run the nonfiction division, so Homeroom was one of our first projects. And then um, I had been cooking up something kind of crazy. I, not, I had also been toying with some fiction projects, and I'd been in the running to, um, first I'd been attached to direct the Colin Kaepernick movie documentary for Russell Simmons. I was literally over at Russell. Ru Russell's an interesting dude, okay? I was like, oh, look at this house. There were these like, two women, I was like, who are these women? Like, why are they the name? Like, one of them looked kind of like just spaced out. And, and then after the meeting, it got a little contentious. We argued a little bit. I think Russell liked that. And he was like, I like you. He's like, we're going to, you want to do some yoga? And I was like, Russell, I don't have any like yoga here. And he's like, no, no I got you. I got you, we get you suited up. And I was like, no, actually I have a meeting, I have to get to the meeting. But it was really nice to meet you and we'll, we'll get into the deal and I'm excited to be working on this project with you. Two weeks later, uh, he, he was me too. And that was the end of Russell Simmons. I mean, he's still out there, but that was the end of him operating in Hollywood in the way that he was. But I've done all this research into sort of the collision of patriotism and protest. Um, and then coincidentally, I was up for Directing the uh, Mexico City 1968 Mexico City Olympic story, Tommy um, John Carlos and Tommy Smith, the famous um, protest stand on the, uh, and so I was like doing all kinds of research on that. Didn't get the the job, um, but sort of had it in my head. And so 
I call up my friend Chris Bowers and I'm like, Chris, he's a composer, brilliant composer. He just won the Oscar for The Last Prepare Shop, which is an amazing short documentary which you must watch. It's on LA Times or something. And I always wanted to do something with Chris. And I said, Chris, what if we um, did a documentary where we rewrote the national anthem? How, how cool would that be? And he was like, ah, oh, that's interesting. And, how we, and then, then that turned into like sending him one. And then we, we was like, you need like a, you're Batman, you need a Robin. And so we actually approached uh, a bunch of like producers. We approached Billy Eilish's um, brother, uh, Phineas. We approached Ludwig, who's my partner in proximity. He's a composer, he's an Oppenheimer. Ludwig's like, I'm Swedish, like, I think that, that, that's not going to work. You know, like, I'll get killed, I'll get destroyed. Um, a lot of people passed. Jack Antonov, Rick Rubin, like, we were, we were shooting from the stars. And everybody was, like, nervous. Because we wanted, like, okay, he's a black composer, let's get, like, somebody who's not black. Everybody passed. Because I think they were freaked out, they were worried about the controversy. So we ended up with uh, Daki, who's uh, just, a, just a beautiful human being. Produces for Kendrick Lamar, Drake, among many other people. So we sent him and Donnie on the road to, uh, to figure out how would you uh, write a new national anthem for America. Well, you gotta go around and have jam sessions with different musicians and do, play the blues, play some R&B, you know, go hang out in Tulsa with Troy um, Harjo, the first Native American poet laureate. Um, Go hang out in the Bay Area with, with Ladonia, you know, and uh, we made this movie. <laughs> Probably anybody's seen this movie. It, 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 is, um, gen it generates a lot of strong feelings, this movie. The New York Times called it naive, the, the, the reviewer, or reviewers, it's just, it's just destroyed me. <laughs> um, letterbox, the letterbox reviews. Just never, like if you're a filmmaker, just don't, don't. Don't read the reviews. It's not healthy. It's not healthy. Uh, but we knew we knew we were taking a chance with this one, and I'm just a softy, and so like I I, I, I do. Uh, it's interesting, you know, because Jimi Hendrix performed the national anthem on stage at Woodstock in I think the year was it year I'm born, '68 or '69, and he played it, um, and he's in our movie, kind of Jimmy. And he, he, his rendering of, of the National Anthem was, was how he saw the country at that time. So there's a lot of static in here. Um, you know, that's not necessarily what we wanted to do, but we wanted to sort of have the conversation. We wanted to go on a journey. And that, that's what this movie is. And so um, it's there on Hulu if you, want, if you want to watch it. And I'm about to land the plane, and then we can answer any questions. Uh, and this movie sort of tied up a lot of the themes of my own life and career the diversity of our country, the diversity of me, the diversity of us, and sort of the messiness and the dialectic of all that, and the meaning of it in the story. Um, but every, every documentary filmmaker that's got any kind of success in his career has got to do a celebrity documentary, okay? It's, a, it's like a bucket list thing, celebrity doc. <laughs> which I vowed I would never do. Um, not maybe I didn't vow, but I never imagined that I would do this. But this, this project came to us early on, it was like right after I started. Steph actually wanted Ryan to direct it, but he was directing this small movie called Wakanda Forever. <laughs> not available. However, you, you don't want me to direct it anymore, you want Pete to do it. He does documentaries, like, you want documentary filming. So I met Steph, and um, he's like, we're the same height, he's like a mixed baby like me, he's born in Akron, it's perfect. And, He's Bay Area, which means that the film is part of my, how do you say it? Oof. 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 <laughs> and so it made sense, so I did it. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. the best question. Yeah, we're, we're trying to, we're actually trying to get a big uh, mental health series mm -hmm. off the ground, uh, uh, just to sort of make sense of what's happening, I think, post-COVID, um, you know, post-COVID, uh, numerous existential crises from the collapse of democracy to climate change to um, uh, wars around, around the world. Um, 
to to the changing, you know, whatever. I mean, you know, technology. I, I think is, I think is a part of it. So we're just trying to uh, push against the limitations of the commercial marketplace and um, do this important project. We've already gotten word from like the the suits at Disney, like, is this entertaining? Question mark. <laughs> No, literally, that, 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 that came down. And so we, we're, we're working now to try to, you know, get this thing, this thing pushed, pushed through. And we're, you know, we're doing other stuff too. It's like, some, we're doing another celebrity who shall not, shall not be named right, right here, but, but he is a singer. Is that not cool? Uh, no, no, we would take it to the market. Oh, cool. Um, we're doing, we're doing a bunch of other stuff. We're, we're, we've been following, um, Kim Rubio lost her daughter in Uvalde, her 10-year-old daughter in Uvalde, and she's now become quite a uh, activist, I guess. Uh, you know, um, and she's not really ready to grieve, and, and so we're sort of telling the story of a, sort of a family dealing with the loss of their uh, child, but also sort of wrapped up in this sort of um, this idea uh, of gun control. So. We got, we got kind of a spectrum of stuff that we're doing that's sort of very commercial and sort of social issue that, that is uh, to some degree a reflection of my sort of work that I did prior to joining the company. What's moving me? But what I tell, tell students all the time is like, when you embark on a project, make sure that you're passionate about it because you got to sustain across what you describe, which is like sometimes two, three years, sometimes more. Ups and downs and bears and, and mountains and walls and shit falling apart and you got to be able to sustain through that and keep believing in it and get over those get through those 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 challenges and I just I don't know sometimes you just know sometimes you start to have second guesses and you doubt uh, uh, you know I bounce stuff off of my wife I bounce stuff off of my son who says all documentaries are mid. <laughs> not real movies. So if I don't, if I pitch him something, it's a doc, and he's like, likes it, then I'm like, well, I'm onto something. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>